So I've been following some of Steven Crowder's Change My Mind videos, and I made a couple response podcasts. The first one I ever did was about hate speeches and real Change My Mind, and this is going to be for the second edition. I think it's really quite interesting that he addressed a lot of the points that I made in the first upload during his second presentation, because some of the things that he had been talking about were like um, kind of the criticisms that we put forward in the first response such as there actually are an enormous amount of limitations on freedom of speech, such as, you know, you can't make calls to violence, you can't make calls to action that would hurt someone, and also other things like slander and libel. Those are forms of speech that are not protected under the First Amendment. But what's really interesting about this discussion is Crowder is using a very, very narrow version of what free speech is. I mean, he's said in the past multiple times there is no hate speech, there is only free speech. Further, but I thought that it was kind of a very bizarre presentation because you could really see in this one that it's loaded with argumentative trickery. And I wish I could be like, this is my own original brilliant find, but I've been watching other kind of criticisms of Steven Crowder, and a lot of people just pointed out that he uses a lot of argumentative trickery in his Change My Mind uh, segments. So I was kind of ready for it and I was looking for it. And his actual definition of hate speech that he is arguing is that he is saying that hate speech isn't real, change my mind, right? Well, his definition is that um, there is no governmental law on the books in America that um, uses the term hate speech. I mean, that's like what he said. And he mentioned this in the second part of his upload when he's debating a girl from Russia, brunette, very good looking, actually. Not that that matters. But anyway, what he was saying is just that he says that there is no governmental law in America that uses the term hate speech. Therefore, I mean, that's what his definition of hate speech isn't real is. Because, like, one of the first and most obvious things that I said in the past was, of course, there is hate speech. There is speech that contains hatred, right? I mean, like, we've talked about that on these uh, recordings in the past. But, like, He's just obviously playing a game, like this is just an argumentative trick. I mean, you might as well say something like, there is no law that prevents you from killing unicorns and drinking their blood, change my mind. That's his definition of hate speech, and you know, just something that doesn't exist. And his only statement is that this law is not on the books. And That's what his statement is. That is literally what he was arguing, and he said this very clearly throughout, you know, the course of this video. So he just wants to get people into a trap because they're talking about, you know, making changes to a law that doesn't exist. So, like, once again, this is an argumentative trap. But you might be thinking, all right, yeah, whatever, big deal. You're just nitpicking at one sentence that he threw in there. What he's actually talking about, and there maybe is some truth to this, that should we have laws against hate speech in America? Should there actually be laws that are well, hate speech laws. I mean, if you want to come at it from that particular standpoint, and we we do need to bear in mind that this is not just, you know, some YouTuber. I mean, this is much larger than Steven Crowder. Elizabeth Warren was talking in the Senate about actually having hate speech laws because hate speech serves as an existential threat to certain communities and that these laws need to be put in place to um, protect them. So this is something that is very real, and this is also a um, kind of debate that affects everybody because it affects everybody in the sense that um, all of us would have, all of us would be affected by any law related to speech or language, as, you know, and maybe not people in comas, but as far as we can understand, everybody. Some of the things that Steven Crowder mentions in this video is that he seems very, very nervous about the concept of having government decide who and what is affected by hate speech. Like, he just seemed very opposed to having, you know, the government decide things about what is hate speech and what is not. And he brought this up multiple times. And, like, I, what I, what, but I really would have to question Stephen Crowder's understanding of what the government actually is in America. I mean, the government is a representative system. That's why we have things called, like, the House of Representatives. Furthermore, who elects the people in the Senate? Well, the constituents, the voters, the electorate. The voters also are, you know, if... They also elect the president via the popular vote, which some states have to follow, other states do not. But even, you know, the electoral votes are also chosen by citizens. Everything in the United States government is organized by citizens. Just so when you actually talk about just exporting this authority over to the government, it's not like the government is this barrier in between the citizens and 
in the power structure? No, absolutely not. The government is comprised of the ideas voted for by the citizens. The citizens are the government. I mean, and the, it's a government by, by and for the people. And you might be thinking, that's just theoretical. Yes, absolutely, that is just theoretical. But um, at the same time, every decision and every law that we have is decided by the citizens, by people who are voting for it. So what are you talking about why you think that that's a bad idea to have government make laws in relation to the First Amendment. Furthermore, I mean, I would have to question his legal understanding because everything in the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, the entire Constitution is not always what it says it is. It is evolving based on Supreme Court cases over the last 200 and 250 years, and those are done by the judicial branch. And you might be thinking that the judicial branch is not voted upon by the citizens. No, but they're appointed by the president and it's vote upon, voted upon by the Senate who represent their constituents. So once again, everything in the government is chosen by the citizens, so it's not like this government is this massive evil entity that humans can't control. No, the government is chosen by the people. So why is there any sort of problem at all about what is he so afraid of about having the government make decisions by and for the people if they were voted by and for the people? And yes, yes, you might be thinking that's some sort of kind of purely theoretical example, but well, so is Stephen Crowder's point. His point is just, you know, government is bad, and, well, then if you think government's bad, then you elect people who can hopefully be better. And that's just like, it's not the most perfect union, but we need to strive toward a more perfect union. And furthermore, I mean, just because it says freedom of speech in the First Amendment, that is an evolving definition based on the Supreme Court cases for the last 200 and some odd years. Moreover, um, Stephen Crowder tries to make a distinction in between speech that is that involves calls to actions versus free speech. Like there used to be this enormous discussion about freedom of speech, but now they just refer to it as free speech, like being able to speak freely, being able to share ideas freely, the open flow of communication, the marketplace of ideas, many of these things. He differentiated, though, between free speech and calls to action, like if you were to say, I'm going to kill Steven Crowder, just an example or something, that that is illegal and not protected. But it's the action that is illegal, not the language. That is 100% incorrect. Banning things like um, fighting words, calls to action, like that result in immediate violence. And the most famous example of not being able to shout f fire in a crowded theater, if it is, you know, untrue, those things are forms of speech that are not protected by the First Amendment. To sort of say that um, there's a differentiation between free speech and a call to action, but to for, refer, but to say that only the action is illegal, that is purely incorrect. No, calls to action are a form of speech that are not protected. So I would really question his sort of legal understanding there. Now he has one thing here when he says that you are allowed to be racist. For example. I guess you're sort of talking about, you know, does someone have the right to say racist things without repercussions? Or does someone even have the right to be a comedian without repercussions, you know? And they brought up Count Dankula and the, the pug doing the Nazi salute. And, well, one of the things is, first we need to recognize that they're, they're, one of the reasons why you can't draw the distinction between free speech and calls to actions is they are not, you know, separable. Because once speech becomes active, it is not protected. I mean, like, and this actually deals with things like racism. This was why you can't draw the distinction. Are you allowed to tell somebody, get out of my store, you're black? No, you are not. Because once you become active with your racism that affects another person, that's not protected. So what, what is he talking about? Hate speech isn't real, change my mind. Of course, things like that are real. And there are laws in place that prevent people from, you know, doing racist things and saying racist things in the active sense. Furthermore, if you don't accept that, you also cannot say that you can't say in America, get out of my store, you're Canadian, because we are we have laws on the books that prevent people from discriminating based on national origin in public accommodations, you know, places that are frequented by the general public. You are not allowed to tell Steven Crowder, get out of my store, you're Canadian. That is also something that is not protected. So what is he talking about that hate speech isn't real? I mean, you might not find an exact law on the books that uses the words hate speech, which is his actual kind of challenge question. But, I mean, that's kind of a useless thing. I mean, once again, there's probably 
That's like saying, you know, there's no law that says you can't attack unicorns or something. You're just talking about something that doesn't exist, and it's kind of a trap. But if you actually want to say that we we shouldn't have laws that prevent people from using hate speech, well, we already do. It's just they're kind of used in different ways. But you actually want to relate this to freedom of expression, talking about comedians. The 3,000 people that are in the UK that um, every year they get in trouble for hate speech laws. Stephen Crowder says that all of those are illegitimate claims and the government should have no right to do that. But what I fa think he fails to understand is that when you have something of this nature, when you have 3,000 people in the UK getting into legal trouble for their hate speech laws, no matter what, even if those laws are on the books, you don't have to agree with them. They still have a responsibility to know the law and to know when to know their sort of legal limits. They have a responsibility to follow the laws of the land. Otherwise, they can work to change them through the democratic process or leave the country or something of that nature. Even if you think that those laws are not good, the, the citizens of the United Kingdom still have a legal obligation to follow them. So I don't know why he thinks that that's an illegitimate claim when it is most definitely a legitimate claim. What the citizens of the United Kingdom can do is through their own powers of democracy, they could try and elect individuals that would change the law if they actually do not want this law on the books. Um, it was very interesting throughout the video that I heard Steven Crowder challenged everyone, just like, you know, what should be the definition of hate speech? I mean, like, what would you constitute as hate speech? Well, you know, many countries in around the world have banned the Nazi salute or something like that. That is, a you know, a form of expression, right? Because um, Crowder says that um, free speech and fr freedom of expression are not the same thing, but it's generally accepted that they can work um, kind of either simultaneously or in symbiosis. And it's like, if you're going to ban pass a law, let's just use a theoretical example saying you are going to ban the Nazi salute and you cannot say the N-word. Okay, banning the Nazi, Nazi salute and you can't say the N-word. Does that limit any sort of intellectual discussion? No. Does that impede communication? Not in any real sense, not in any sort of sense of magnitude. Absolutely not. And one of, if they were actually to implement something like that in America, I would follow it, and I'm pretty sure you listening to this, you would too. There would probably be some sort of outrage for about seven days, and then people would just carry on with their lives because a law of that nature doesn't actually impact any sort of, well, it doesn't impact, impact any sort of free thought in any major way. So it's like, and one, furthermore, the first guy that Steven Crowder was debating just sort of said, you know, like, oh, what did, I want to get his, I can't remember his exact word, but he's like, so when Steven Crowder's just sort of like, what right do you have to sort of come up with a hate speech law? And he sort of said, because it's not hurtful, you know, and it's like, you know, Crowder was being, taking an enormous amount of liberties. He's even sort of saying something like if a college campus were to pass, you know, or have their own sort of rules, their own sort of code of conduct, where they would be able to say something like, you know, you can't use Ku Klux Klan rhetoric or you can't dress up in Ku Klux Klan ropes on a college campus. That would be the college making their own decisions. He would even sort of go as far as to say that something like that is all right. He just, his entire argument is just, we do not have a law in the United States of America that uses the two words hate speech. So therefore hate speech isn't real, which, you know, is kind of, um, what's the exact word for that? A false syllogism or something or... Well, it's kind of just an erroneous debate. I mean, like it's an erroneous discussion. I mean, once again, you know, you're talking about something that isn't, doesn't actually exist. But although I would say, though, that Stephen Crowder's statement is incorrect for the sole fact that he neglects the to recognize that it is illegal to say racist things to people in public accommodations that affect their actions and movement. So, I mean, if you like, it really would depend on how you sort of want to look at the concept of hate speech. Furthermore, he, Stephen Crowder also had identified the question of who gets to decide what is um, hate speech and what isn't. Well, the first starters is we do. I mean, once again, the citizens elect the representatives. Everything in our governments comes from representatives that were chosen by the electorate or appointed by people who were chosen by the electorate. We get to decide. And uh, the second woman he was debating, you know, the girl I mentioned from Russia, was um, brought up a possibility even like you could comprise, you know, a sort of 
group of, you know, people who are sociologists or something like that. I give her an A for creativity, but I don't even think you need to come at it from that way. I think you could just sort of say the elected representatives that were chosen by the voters. I mean, they can choose that because that's the same as the voters choosing. That is the entire concept of a representative democracy. So I don't really know why Steven Crowder is so afraid of that other than he wants to present his material in an intentionally confusing way so people won't know how to respond to it. But um, I would really want, I'm just very surprised that um, more people didn't respond to the question directly about what things should be constituted as hate speech. I mean, even if you're going to take 45 words and you have 45 racial slurs out of the English language or something like that, and you are going to be like, these 45 words are illegal. Once again, how does that really impede intellectual discussions? How does that impede communication? And if somebody is going to be posting stuff like that on their Twitter feed, knowing that it's illegal to use those words, they have to deal with the consequences. You don't have to follow the law in the United States of America, but if you don't follow the law, then you have to deal with the consequences and the repercussions. So even if people in Europe or the United Kingdom or Canada are violating a law that is related to language and the language and ideas that people are expressing, well, you might not think that that's a good law, but that does not excuse them for a second from, you know, being ignorant of the laws of their country and not following the laws of their country. And if you're going to talk about some extreme case such as this uh, Count Dangula, whoever he is, who had the pug do the Nazi salute getting into legal trouble, that is something where you would get your attorney to ask the court for leniency or something like that because that's obviously just a very extreme case. And just because there are extreme cases in certain ways – that doesn't mean that um, you can't have a hate speech law in America. And even if you were to implement a hate speech law in America, once again, the backlash for this, the sort of negative repercussions that Steven Crowder is talking about aren't necessarily – well, he doesn't actually give a very good reason about what the negative implications would be. He's just more, more or less what Steven Crowder's point is that – he just wants to kind of preserve the status quo. He's like, we don't have a law, so therefore all things are – we have you know, very open free speech laws and we don't have hate speech laws. So like he just kind of wants to preserve the status quo. But once again, there really is no preserving the status quo in terms of the law. Everything in the Constitution is evolving, and that includes the First Amendment. The First Amendment is a lot more – it's a lot trickier than people give credit to. Furthermore, bringing up examples of you know things like Nazi Germany, Stalinist Russia, Maoist China, as you know things that limited freedom of speech and they, or sorry, limited free speech to get our terms right, that those things are more destructive than the United States of America, and that there is no country in the world where, you know, that has a better system than the United States of America. Well, you know, that doesn't mean for a second that the United States can't improve. And the uh, last person that he was debating, the um, uh, the gentleman who was a PhD candidate, not sure his name, he just sort of said, we're not there yet. And that's kind of the most honest and thoughtful answer that you can give. It doesn't mean that the United States can't improve. And just because we have the sort of – our doesn't mean we ever have to preserve the status quo for the sake of only preserving the status quo. And it does not mean that we can't strive toward a more perfect union which in fact is the entirety of all the U.S. Constitution because everything that is in the United States Constitution, the articles and the amendments, all have to coincide with the preamble. They all have to support the preamble, all those you know, kind of implied powers, and one of them is to strive toward a more perfect union. So that means that these things have to be evolving and to just sort of say that we need to preserve the status quo for – well, once again, he doesn't really give the best reasons about why that's necessary other than to say that, you know, there is no hate speech at all. America is just has free speech. Well, I mean, that's once again, it's sort of an argumentative trap. It's almost just like saying maybe you could say there is no 28th Amendment. There is no 36th Amendment. Change my mind. He might as well be saying something like that. It's sort of a non-existential question, which is, well – no one can really prove him right or wrong about anything because that just kind of doesn't exist. It's an irrational discussion to begin with the way that Steven Crowder is presenting it. But to challenge his point once again, should we have hate speech laws on the books? Absolutely, we already have them. You can't be racist in the active sense and you can't discriminate against race, creed, color, national origin, all of those things are all included in the 1964 Civil Rights Act and its amendments because things like that, the Civil Rights Act, are also evolving. 
and they also can be dealt with in um, various, various aspects of the legal system. Not only the Supreme Court, but also other aspects of the legal system can tie into the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Immigration Act of 1965. All of these things can be connected, and you cannot make certain discriminatory remarks in America. You can't put up signs in your store that say, no Irish need apply. We also cannot do things like the Chinese Exclusion Act. Things like that would no longer be permissible in our 21st century society. So absolutely there are hate speech laws in America. But if you want to say, do we actually use the two words hate speech? I mean, that's kind of a pointless, that's kind of a pointless debate and discussion. Furthermore, and once again, to sort of reiterate who decides, well, the voters decide, the people decide, the citizens who are living in the United States of America, we decide through the powers of representative democracy, through the vote, and through what is known as the electorate, decide on what is going to be happening with any of these things. So just to say that the government, involve, government involvement in this issue is a bad thing is not only impractical, it's also completely contrary to the entirety of how the law functions. And, you know, it's like, um, should we actually do something like this, you know, just to have sort of an honest moment? Should we actually ban the N-word and the Nazi salute? If they were to pass that law, I would follow it. But, you know, it's like, I don't really know if that's even, I don't even know how necessary that is actually going to be in our current way of thinking. I'm not sure the exact specifications of the work that Elizabeth Warren was going to be putting forward. Because, you know, somebody brought up a very good point in the first part of Stephen Crowder's video when he was like, one, the one way we could solve this issue is just by making things like that very taboo because we don't really live like that in the United States of America. You know, the um, things like the N-word are said very affectionately in hip-hop music and, you know, hip-hop culture as well. And also things like the Nazi salute are used very heavily and um, by comedians, people who are just making jokes, humorous things. And one, definitely we could come at this from a way where we could make things just more taboo, but to say that um, just, just the criticisms I felt that Stephen Crowder was making against legislation that would deal with hate speech, I thought were actually quite contrary to, well, the, the functionality of the law, the way a law is meant to function, the way the Constitution is meant to function, the way the First Amendment is meant to function. And I thought he was overlooking major things, especially the role of the Civil Rights Act and its implications on what people are allowed to say. And like, I mean, Stephen Crowder and Milo once appeared in an event and they were complaining about we're being told what we can and cannot say. Well, guess what? That's been going on for centuries. I mean, Yes, absolutely. There all, there's all sorts of, you know, legislation out there that affects what you can and cannot say. I mean, like, are you allowed to try and tell a group of Japanese people that they need to be interned and they need to be put in some type of labor camp and then they – to actually force them to do it using only your language manipulation and coercion? I mean, no, you aren't allowed to do that because that, of, that violates their rights. So – I mean, I really would just have to say that um, there are so many things that are connected to speech law that are already illegal that Stephen Crowder is grossly overlooking. But anyway, that's my little rant on the subject. What do you think?